Hello and welcome to the Classic Key Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Goff. Classic Key is your one-stop shop for the wide world of cinema from Eastern Europe. Subscribers gain access to our library of classic and contemporary films, as well as filmmaker interviews, video introductions, program notes, and much more. You can sign up for a seven-day free trial today at classicky.online. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with the Canadian filmmaker Atom Egoyan. Since he broke out in the 1980s as part of the Toronto New Wave, Atom has been one of Canada's most acclaimed directors, with films like Exotica and The Sweet Hereafter receiving awards at Cannes and elsewhere. Atom is also a member of the Armenian diaspora. Born into the Armenian community in what is now Egypt, he moved with his family to Canada as a young boy. Many of his early films deal with his heritage and questions of identity, from his feature debut Next of Kin to his 2002 epic Ararat, which delves into the history of the Armenian genocide. I sat down with Atom to talk about the role his heritage has played in his career, how he's grappled with it on screen, and the gems of classic Armenian film that have inspired him. And when you finish listening, make sure to check out his recommendations on Classic E. Atom Egoyan, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, pleasure to be here. So if we can just start with your, your personal history. You were born in the Armenian community in what is now Egypt. It was the United Arab Republic then. Um, that's obviously one of many Armenian diaspora communities around the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And then when you were very young, you moved to Victoria in British Columbia in Canada. Uh, so I've, I've seen you say in interviews that when you were a child in Canada, you were striving for assimilation, that you didn't speak Armenian at home. So at mm. what point did you start to make that connection with, with the Armenian part of your identity? And at what point did that kind of link up with your desire to become a filmmaker? Well, uh, my Armenian identity was never actually something that was not clear to me. I mean, I, I always knew I was Armenian. Uh, we were a very unusual family in Victoria, BC. Uh, we were the only Armenian family in the city and we didn't have, uh, obviously any of the pillars of the community there. There was no church, there was no community center. Um, and we spoke English in the house from an early point. My, my parents would speak Armenian to each other. And so I grew up understanding the language, but it wasn't something I, I used at home. And it wasn't until I left Victoria at the age of 18 to go to the University of Toronto that I was aware that there was a, an Armenian community. Uh, at that point, there was a, there was an Armenian student association, but there was also a, a large Armenian community in Toronto. And I began to remake those connections with the community. Uh, I began to learn the alphabet. Uh, there was uh, at the... At the Anglican College I was at, at Trinity College at the University of Toronto, there was, strangely enough, uh, an Armenian priest who was the Anglican chaplain there. And so he had studied to be an Armenian priest, became disillusioned with the church, and then converted to high Anglicanism, which is actually quite close uh, in terms of the the, the liturgy to the Armenian right. church. It was an easy conversion. Uh, but he did know Armenian, and so I I, I learned uh, the alphabet from from uh, Father Harold Nahabidian, uh, and and then I became really involved with the the politics at the time. It was very fervent. There was this uh, a lot of uh, uh, Armenian extremism. Uh, there were uh, when would this have been in the early eighties? This is okay. the early eighties. I was writing theater. I had been writing theater from a very young age in Victoria, but I started be, becoming involved with the film club at the University of Toronto. Actually, they had rejected one of my plays, so I, I decided that on spite, <laughs> I'd make it a film. <laughs> and so, but the moment I I began to 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 make films with this uh, hand wound uh, bolex, I, I just became really excited and uh, the feeling that the camera could actually represent another character. Uh, characters that often wasn't in the drama, but was being felt by people who were missing this presence and the presence would be the lens. And so I just became really excited, quite intoxicated with this idea. And and it, it emerged around the same time as I was making these links back to my own background, my, 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 my heritage. So the first feature, Next of Kin, uh, 
really deals with this question of identity. But I would say even some of the shorts, uh, Open House, also were dealing with this question mm. of of identity. It's it's there uh, in in certain um, obvious and not so obvious aspects of the film. But in Next of Kin, it's quite clear there you have this right. Armenian family who had given up their child for adoption. You have an English Canadian boy who's, who's watching a tape of this Armenian family while they're in therapy because he's in therapy himself. And he decides to masquerade uh, and and pr present himself to this Armenian family as their long lost son, which is something that he's made up entirely based on information he's been able to cull from the from the therapy tapes that he's watching surreptitiously. Um, and then uh, my second feature, uh, family viewing, was something that also dealt, was very personal, actually, uh, dealing with the relationship with my grandmother. Uh, who was uh, the repository of my of my language? Because while she was with us in Victoria, I, I did speak Armenian with her. It was the only language mm. we lived in. So the family viewing is a fantasy about a boy uh, who's somehow saving his Armenian grandmother from this terrible nursing home she's in. I won't get into the intricacies of the plot, but I will say that um, it was uh, with that second feature. Um, I was invited to an Armenian film festival in Paris. Mm -hmm. in the summer of 1987. And uh, I was there to present my first feature, uh, Next of Kin, but I also had a new print of Family Viewing and I gave it its world premiere uh, it, at the cinema in Paris uh, during this Armenian film festival. And it was the, uh, at this Armenian film festival that I met this contingent of, uh, of filmmakers who were visiting from the then Soviet Republic of Armenia. So at this festival, I, I met... Um, uh, uh, I met Malyan, uh, Enric Malyan, the great mm -hmm. director. I also met uh, uh, Albert um, Megerdichian, who is the brother of, uh, of Fronzik uh, Megerdichian, the great actor. I met uh, Bagrat Hovenesian, who had made uh, Autumn Sun, uh, which I saw in Paris at the time. I, I saw all these films in, in Paris during the festival. Uh, and I also met... Uh, uh, Tigran Mansurian, the the composer. The composer yeah. so, so I really I feel quite privileged that um, I had this contact with these with with this great, you know, community of Armenian filmmakers in in Paris when I was quite young. There's a picture of me with them actually somewhere, um, and I I really cherish that 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 contact. If we can just can we just go back a sec? I'm really interested. So you you moved to Toronto in the early '80s, and like you say, there was quite a kind of fervent political atmosphere in, in Armenian communities at sure. the time. So in the Soviet Union in the 80s, around kind of perestroika is when you start to see the rise of these kind of nationalist movements pushing for independence and so on. Could you just describe a little bit what it was like in the, what the Armenian diaspora was sure. like in Toronto, I mean, what the atmosphere let's be, was? Yeah, let's be clear that the extremism that was um, obvious in the Armenian diaspora and community was not really linked to perestroika. It was really linked sure, to sure, weapons, but it, yeah. uh, uh, the Armenian genocide, right? And, 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 and justice for uh, this terrible uh, crime, uh, which had never been uh, recognized by the, by the perpetrator. So there were uh, a number of, uh, you know, it was really a, around, I would say 65, 50 years after the Armenian genocide began, that there was this uh, attempt to 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 try and 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 find some sort of justice, and that really um, in the early eighties, late starting in the late seventies, really we, we saw these these terrorist uh, attacks, um, Armenians who were uh, targeting uh, Turkish diplomats, and uh, it was something that uh, was really. Uh, very shocking, I suppose, because it wasn't something that I understood in terms of my own upbringing. Mm. Uh, certainly when I met my wife, Arce Hanjan, some years later, um, I understood it better because she was raised in a very nationalist uh, Armenian community in, in Beirut. And I think the response of most of the community was that it was it was something that uh, m many people understood in spirit, but they couldn't support that sort of violence. It just right. felt it was, it was it was really um, not something that could be supported. This was, of course, uh, at a time when when uh, when in England you were experiencing also these terrible uh, terrorist attacks from the IRA, and so so it was very much in the air. You know that this was something that uh, um, that many people were trying to understand, like this idea of frustration exploding into these random. 
or I should say calculated acts of violence against innocent uh, innocent people. So how did we get into this? This is kind of like, a ver- but, 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 but it is something that uh, I think- But it's important uh, context. I mean, it's- It is an important context and it's not something that's discussed very often because it, exactly, it is yeah. something that the community would rather not talk about, but it was a, a part of what was actually roiling through a lot of people's attention at that time. But you mentioned your wife, Asne Hanjan, there, who's in many of your films. Mm-hmm. Um, and the film of yours that I think, well, for me, I, you, I'm, feel free to disagree, but for me really brings uh, this Armenian question, if you like, to the fore is uh, the film you made with her in 1993, Calendar. Yes. Um, which really almost literalizes a lot of these questions. Um, it's a film about in which you yourself and your wife star um and it's about a photographer uh you atomagoyan uh traveling to armenia to to photograph churches accompanied by his wife played by your real life wife who is Mm -hmm. serving as a translator and it's about the sense of dislocation and it's a it's about how this relationship is affected by this journey and this encounter with the Armenian landscape, Armenian uh, culture, Armenian religious traditions, and so on. Could you just tell us a little bit about about the kind of conception of that, and and about what, working with your wife on that on that project? Well, it was a very interesting project because it came out of this very bizarre circumstance. Uh, we had shown the adjuster at the Moscow Film Festival in the summer of 1991. And, and won a major prize there. And part of this major prize that we won was a million rubles to make a film in the Soviet Union. And so I thought, well, what a great opportunity. So to a shoot. million to make a film in the Soviet Union in 1991? Yes. yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is that, is that uh, at that point, uh, Armenia was still part of the Soviet Union. Uh, and we traveled to Armenia to start scouting locations because a million rubles was actually was pegged uh, to the American dollar at the time. So it was an exorbitant amount of money for me, like just to fall into my lap and to make a film in in Soviet Armenia. But of course, over the <laughs> over the course of the following months, so the, the Soviet Union fell apart and the ruble became devalued to the point where it was worthless. So so this dream project that I began to uh, uh, whip up really in the summer of 91 when I got the prize uh, evaporated but it it, it it was something that once once the idea came I, I I couldn't really let it go and so at the Rotterdam Film Festival in the following year uh, I I pitched it at the at the at the Cinemart which was uh, a way to try and find budgets for low budget films and and someone from the German television station Arte uh, under the umbrella of um, uh, Das Kleine Fernschespiel, which is this experimental film program that they had, uh, said really that if I could if I could shoot this for a hundred thousand um, dollars, I, I, I could I, I could go ahead. And so on on that uh, promise, we went to Armenia in the summer of, of 1992 and shot this film. Uh, we had ten rolls, 400 foot rolls of 16 millimeter film and uh, shot this very, uh, I would say, quite stringently, knowing we had so 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 little film. Uh, we planned these 10 static shots at various churches. Now, part of this was also this ex- excitement that some of these churches were film, were, were locations that had been used in uh, Sergei Parajanov's masterpiece, The Color of Pomegranates. Right. Um, so we were shooting at the Ahpad Monastery. We were shooting at Sanahin. We were shooting at these places that uh, had had a tremendous meaning for me just because I, that, that film was so important. And um, I won't go into the premise of the film, but, but really it was a uh, very personal work. Um, and it really looks at this question of our Armenian identity from three different perspectives. My character, the photographer, who's making these 12 calendar images for uh, a calendar that will be dispersed in the diaspora. In fact, my connection to the Armenian identity while I was a boy in Victoria was once a year, we would get these church calendars um, sent to us. So uh, that also that, that's a directly object. autobiographical detail. Yes. So here I here I was now playing a character who's shooting these the, these ah, these see. blows. Uh, I was there uh, with my wife, who was playing the translator, since my character didn't speak Armenian, and uh, so she represents someone who was raised in in an Armenian community, 
uh, in this case, very much playing herself, uh, who was raised in the Armenian community in, in, in Beirut. And then we had a guide, a Soviet Armenian, who was taking us from one place to another. And over the course of the film, I watch basically as, as my wife, Arsene, falls in love with the guide. Um, it was, yes, very much uh, an opportunity to go back to our, our homeland uh, and to make this really uh, direct and quite um, I would say it felt at the time quite urgent sort of statement of what the nature of the identity was. And uh, it's a film that I really have come to, um, yeah, I, I, I cherish it because it's, it's, it's also a film where you couldn't make it right now because those, those sites that we were visiting are all major tourist sites. And uh, I know I've been know. to several of them. Right. And right. I was so, thinking this looks awfully uh, unspoiled. Believe it or not. Compared to we were my experience. With, Right. Uh, when we were shooting, we were the only people there, like uh, all day long. We had all the, all day, you know, these magnificent sites where we had to ourselves. And so we were able to wait for the right moment of light. And we were able to kind of contemplate and meditate what it meant to be at those places. And that became part of the conversations that we had uh, at these magnificent uh, church sites and monastery sites uh, spread all over the country, really. And it's really one of the things when I when I watch these films uh, that are that are uh, that are available to us now. I mean, it's the it's the way these the, the church architecture kind of is is always there somehow. It's it's just so interesting to me. You know, one of the films that's on the channel is a film called um, Autumn Sun by uh, Bagrat Hovhannisian, mm. and it's interesting to note that Bagrat Hovhannisian was uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's assistant um, on on some of his films. Um, Andre Rublev, and uh, and and so here's an interesting fact that uh, that uh, Bagrat Ovenesian's uh, first feature was a film called The Wine Press, mm -hmm. and like Tarkovsky has a credit on it because he was the artistic supervisor, and when you watch that film, you can definitely see the influence of Tarkovsky uh, in the composition, in the church, uh, sh in the sh shots of the church, in much the same way that when you look at the beginning of Autumn Sun, that first shot of the dog in the field and the figure in the distance, it, it you really feel that there's something there in Tarkovsky from Tarkovsky as well that you will see in in Mirror that you will certainly see in in a film like um, uh, Nostalgia with, with the image of the dog yeah. in the church and so so the 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 spirit of Tarkovsky really refracts through the films of Bagrat Ovenesi and the two films that we have of his so. Uh, Yes, yeah, so the churches are really important in, in these films. Um, they are the spiritual, I, I suppose they are, they're so foundational, I think, to what the identity means. And that's why I think this recent um, terrible um, nightmare of what happened in, in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, where mm. uh, over 100,000 Armenians were were really uh, deracinated, ethnically cleansed from, from this territory they'd inhabited for so, for so many centuries. But the, it's very painful for Armenians that these churches, these ancient churches are now uh, not available to us. And, and these monasteries, historic monasteries, our first school is, is in this area. So we, it's, it's just this feeling of, uh, oh, it, it's, 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 it's a very melancholic sense of, of, of what has been lost. And that certainly comes up in Ararat, you know, when you look at the boy Rafi's videos, when he's visiting Ani, when he's, when he's talking about the, the land that, that that's been lost and this feeling of, uh, where are, especially as a diasporan Armenian, like where are where our people are from, like uh, which is, you know, in in, in my case, you know, uh, uh, a village called Arabkir, where my grandparents were from, uh, which is not really available to us anymore, and or, yeah. or there's there's absolutely no trace of the Armenian presence that was there, and that was a large Armenian uh, town, so. So, so these these feelings refract. It's interesting when you look at the Soviet films because they're they have a, you know, the the Soviet the, the Armenians that have lived in what is now Armenia have have had a continual sort of uh, uh, relationship to that particular uh, part of the country. So you do have our a major church, Etchmiadzin, is within what was Soviet Armenia and is now the, the the Republic of Armenia. And we do have all the sites that you're seeing in calendar. Are are situated in in what is currently Armenia. I would mm. say 
like at one point there at the monastery of uh, the church of uh, uh, Noravank, which is very close to the border and is probably an area that is more threatened. And, ha- and actually, if you listen very closely to the soundtrack uh, in, in, in Calendar, you can hear gunfire because it, there, there was an active war, you know, going on with, with Azerbaijan during that, the period that we were shooting. Right. It's interesting talking about this idea of spirituality and you drawing out those links with this uh, kind of contemporaneous kind of Soviet filmography, this this kind of strand of Soviet filmmaking that's kind of transnational with Tarkovsky, Parajanov, and then these other Armenian figures, right? It's 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 clear that the way that these Armenian filmmakers belong to this particular strand of um auteurist spiritual um Soviet filmmaking that that most people in the West, for instance, would kind of just associate with Tarkovsky and, and Parajanov. Yes. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting when you look at the history of Armenian cinema, because there are these two strands. Um, there is a, a diasporic strand. Uh, and and in a way, in some ways, when I explain it to people, I talk about these two giants. Uh, uh, one is uh, Hamobek Nazarian. Uh, mm. Hamobek Nazarian was born in Yerevan. And uh, at the age of uh, twenty, migrated to 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 Tbilisi, which was uh, in some ways the intellectual core of the Armenian intelligentsia. And then you have someone like um, Mamulyan. So Ruben Mamulyan, who was who was born in Tbilisi, mm-hmm. and in 1920, the time when Hamobek Nazarian arrives there from Yerevan, um, uh, Ruben Mamulyan leaves Tbilisi to go to London. And, and then uh, to Hollywood and, eventually. And then to Hollywood. So he becomes actually one of the most important Hollywood directors. Hamobek Nazarian, who is really considered to be the founder of Armenian cinema, uh, you know, first of all, makes a number, like uh, I've seen that that film is available on your channel, um, C- City Under Volcano. House so Under Volcano. Film, House Under the Volcano. So that's, that's a very interesting film in terms of the current Azeri uh, Armenian conflict because it really it, it's it's a collaboration between the two Soviet. Right, yeah, it's set in Baku in the oil. It's set in Baku and actually plays the Armenian um, um, like capitalist, you know, almost as a as an anti-Semitic figure, right? I mean, it's mm. quite interesting to kind of see how the Armenian is demonized by an Armenian filmmaker. Though, of course, there's also the the good Armenian character as well. But it, it's interesting to see uh, Bek Nazarian's uh, fluency in the two cultures. And then he goes on to make these very important Armenian films, uh, like uh, Land of Nairi is considered to be really one of the first Armenian indigenous films, silent film. And then he made uh, uh, Beppo, which is um, a sound film. And uh, yes, he's really considered to be like, you know, the founder of the Armenian um, Namos. Namos was... Uh, actually, it's actually, Namus was the first indigenous silent film. Yeah, Namus uh, is usually kind of listed as the first in quote, right. Armenian film. That's right. That's right. Nineteen twenty-six, I think. That's right. Twenty-five or twenty-six. 25, or and then a land of Nairi made 1930. It's sort of the propaganda film, which is about the the birth of the the republic. And um, and then, uh, as I say, Beppo. Uh, is 35 in its first Armenian sound film. So you have these two figures, Hamo Bek Nazarian, uh, who's the founder of the Armenian indigenous cinema. And then you have Ruben uh, Mamulian, who's, who's, who's a diasporan filmmaker uh, and um, is uh, really associated with this other sort of tradition, I suppose. And, I, and, and I'm a humble uh, descendant of that tradition of an Armenian diasporan filmmaker. But you're right in saying that a film like Calendar is I think I, I, it was the first really uh, the first film made in the Republic of Armenia by diaspora and Armenian filmmaker. We 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 were there really at, 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 as the country became independent. So it, it's uh, it's an important film for me personally, and I think it it has this strange this strange way of chronicling a a, a certain moment in the in 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 the nation's evolution certainly, and and with this moment where the diaspora actually had this dream come true like like any armenian child going to a, a school is 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 raised with this idea of, of there one day being a, an independent armenia and and suddenly in, in 91 92 it fell into our laps and we happened to be shooting there while that was occurring well let's let's talk about ararat then uh, your 2002 film which is you know it's your your grandest artistic statement if you like on these questions of Armenian identity and, and history. It's a film about 
uncovering personal and national histories, quite literally, it's about the mm. process of learning about the Armenian genocide. Uh, and it's also, you know, very pointedly a film about filmmaking. Mm. Um, the genocide is, I mean, obviously, it's a topic that seems to exert this kind of gravitational pull on Armenian filmmakers and Armenian artists. So why did you decide at that point in your career that you wanted to go there, as it were? And then why did you uh, adopt the, the, this kind of story within a story within a story framework that, uh, that you did in order to, to actually kind of tackle this, this history? Well, the why is really because of an invitation from a, a, um, a producer in Canada, Robert Lantosh, uh, who was really uh, the, the head of a, a large film company here, Alliance at the time, which was instrumental in supporting films like Exotica and The Sweet Hereafter. And there was a function for me uh, because of the success of The Sweet Hereafter at the Armenian Community Center. And they asked Robert to introduce me. And Robert uh, did something extraordinary and entirely unexpected. Uh, he's, he's, he stood in front of this large hall at the Armenian Community Center uh, full of my, my uh, other members of, of the community and said um, that as a, as, a, as a Hungarian Jew, he had seen many representations of the, of the Holocaust uh, but he had never seen a film about the Armenian genocide. And if uh, I was prepared, he would support the making of such a film. Wow. And this crowd just stood on its feet and started cheering. And I just began to kind of sink in my chair. I was about, about to head off to England um, and Ireland to shoot Felicia's Journey, you know, my adaptation of the William Trevor, Trevor novel. And the last thing I had on my mind was to make a film about the Armenian genocide. But um, Robert, you know, threw down the gauntlet and said he would support it. And I found out later on that the support came with one condition, which is that he had access to this fund that he created as he was exiting Alliance. Um, and so I had to make the film within a certain period of time. And uh, the only thing that I had as a point of departure was this script I'd written in my early 20s which was the film that you're seeing within the film. It was like kind of this fantasy I had about this historic epic. Uh, I don't know why I wrote it, except I was I was writing a lot about, um, I discovered the, the journals of, of Clarence Usher, who was an uh, American physician who was stationed at a missionary in, in, in Vaughan. And so I kind of sketched out this idea for a, a possible film that I would make sometime in the future. Uh, when you had the, the budget Robert. for a big period. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just, it was just sort of this fantasy I had in my, in my early 20s as I started making films. So to, just, I, just to clarify, in case people are listening, haven't seen the film yet. So the film being made within the film is this kind of biopic, kind of fictionalized biopic of the Armenian painter Arshil Gorky, uh, right. which kind of ties <laughs> Arshil Gorky's uh, biography into the story of the Armenian genocide, specifically the, the siege of this city called but, Van in Eastern okay. Turkey. But to add to the complication, yes. So to it, add to the complication, dot, 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 yes. It, it, the actual story of what happened in Van is, a, is an eyewitness account based on Clarence Usher, who was an American physician who was positioned at this missionary. He was the head of a missionary and mm -hmm. where they were harboring many Armenians who were fleeing from this... Um, uh, rebellion that happened in Vaughan. And so, look, I won't even begin to uh, to give you a summary of the film. No, it's incredibly let's... messy and, and complex. It's the result of my trying to tell a story that I felt was 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 personal to me, which is that um, that the, the 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 identifying condition of the Armenian genocide is not what happened, but that there was this systematic denial of what happened, which continues to this day. So I wanted to tell a film about the 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 psychological effect of denial uh, on how the, in the transmission of trauma the the denial of that trauma becomes uh, actually um, a very a, a perverse force which uh, which means that you're repeating this sort of moment of trauma in trying to uh, explain it or defend it uh, and where there's this constant need to kind of see all different positions um and the 
authority of, of, of what is actually truth becomes up for grabs in a way. So it was a, an insane way to try and make a film really, which is, well, which, which was really the first attempt to, to, to tell the story that would be seen publicly. I think now the film probably uh, makes more sense because we have had uh, Fatih Akin's film, The Cut. We've had the Taviani Brothers, brother, Brothers film, um, The Lark Farm. We've had the, the, this group, big Hollywood epic with uh, Oscar Isaacs and, and, and um, Christian Bale called uh, The Promise. And each of these three films, in some ways, doesn't escape the 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 condition I'm critiquing, I suppose, in Ararat, which is that there's something uh, there's something very frail, and I would say almost um, insurmountable in showing a piece of history which has not been um, properly understood. Mm. by the public at large you know this responsibility of having to explain the history and 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 paint it in this way which compensates for denial creates this almost kitschy palette i would say it, it it can't help but have this propagandistic sort of quality to it so i took the i would say bold step of trying to chronicle that visual condition in the film so the film within the film does have the hallmarks of these three other films that then uh, proceeded to come afterwards um I'm I'm super proud of the film. I understand that it's it was very challenging at the time. It 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 marked a huge break from my filmmaking practice. And some will argue I never really fully recovered from it because uh, I think I was making a certain type of film up to Ararat, and then I made that film. And I I would say that a, a large part of the films I made since have been in response to what happened to my career when I made that film, because suddenly I was a film like calendar uh, fit into the body of work I was doing, but a film like era actually makes a break from that. And, and I would say it's, it is messy. I would say that there are a lot of tangents in it that were not fully uh, digested because I had to make the film in a bit of a hurry to meet the condition mm. of how I was able to actually um, raise the money. But I don't apologize for it at all. I, I'm very proud of that film, and and uh, I think I think in the context of all the films that came after, it it has uh, it, it it explains itself better now than it did in 2002 when we premiered it. It's interesting to hear you describe it in those terms because I mean it's obviously a break in terms of maybe the the the, sen- the sheer scale of mm. of the various narratives, but watching it again before this this conversation it did strike me as very much a, an atomagoyan film in its in its kind of narrative structure its non-linear non-linearity its kind of sense of dislocation and these themes of of alienation of identity and so on it it really i mean applied to this huge historical personal and national trauma but it did it doesn't feel to me uh, uh, as an outside uh, looking in like a, a huge departure formally yeah i'll tell you something which just occurred to me as you're saying that now and i i, I haven't thought about this but the idea of history and finding a metaphor and using cinema and the importance of cinema in being able to transcribe and to hold that history you know that i was of a generation i suppose that knew about the holocaust through through the works of uh, you know Anne Frank or or Primo Levi or you know like these writers, but that a new generation would would actually understand it through a film like Schindler's List that that would be their access to that history. So those ideas were swirling around as I was thinking of this way of of approaching Ararat and and this idea also that I really wanted and this was the most the most ambitious part of the film maybe is that I wanted to show these four generations. I wanted to show uh, a survivor of the Armenian genocide and that is. Uh, portrayed by Arshil Gorky, who is our most famous survivor, um, who went on to, you know, the, the great abstract expressionist uh, American painter, mm. uh, who changed his name from Vostani Gaduyan to, to Arshil Gorky to further complicate it, uh, denied his Armenian uh, heritage because of his own trauma as, as a survivor. And then to show a child of a survivor, which is played by the Charles Aznavour character, um, who's making this historic epic in memory of his mother, trying to tell his mother's story, much like perhaps the French director Henri Vernoy tried to tell his mother's story in, in a film he made about the Armenian genocide 10 years before called uh, Myri. 
mm-hmm. and then a grandchild of the of the genocide played by Arsene Khanjan who is who's a, an academic who's uh, who, who's focusing on the work of Arshil Gorky and is then invited into this film production that the uh, Charles Aznavour character is playing and then a great grandchild who is uh, Arsene Khanjan's son Rafi played by David Alpe who is uh, who's who is a driver on the film? Who, who is hired as a as a, a onset apprentice? And I felt that you know, in telling these, I wanted to find a way of telling these four generations and seeing how they could inter, interact with each other. So yes, it is structurally very ambitious that way, and it floats quite quite freely between these four different sort of periods. And actually, at one point, at points there's moments of magic realism where clearly characters that are situated in one time period wouldn't be in, in, in the present day, but exist in certain characters' imagination. So, so I, I, I just feel like I, but I, I see it as a break because I had to, in speaking of the film, I had to take, uh, I had to be something of a polemicist, right? I had to, t- I, I had to, in these press conferences, and as I was going around, I was talking about my work in a way that I haven't before. Uh, my my work, even a film like Calendar, I, I didn't have to explain something from a historic perspective to people. So I wasn't put in, into that position, which I think I I resisted at first, but then I realized it, I needed to. There was, no, there was no way around that. So when the film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2002, there were all sorts of protests outside the, the actual screening. And, you know, the, the the press conference was certainly charged. And, uh, you know, there were a number of Turkish journalists who, who took offense to it. And I suddenly realized I was in the middle of this of this battle and, and I had to react accordingly. And I think it just surprised a lot of the journalists that I was in that in that arena, that I was in that I was I was wrestling that that particular match, which which wasn't really part of my formation at all as a as a as as a young filmmaker so it was a break from that point of view and is that why is that reaction partly why you've not really tackled uh or kind of returned to these kind of armenian questions if we can call them that since then that's a very good question that's a very good question um i i i don't know really if i have anything else to say from a diasporan perspective, I think there's a there are many stories that need to be told, and there is a generation now of of younger filmmakers who are telling those stories. You know, we we are really fortunate to have, um, like for there was a wonderful documentary called 1489, which just won uh, Idfa by um, Shoagad Bardanyan. Um, there is a film like The Wind Will Carry Us by Nora Martirosian. There is a film that you're showing on on on, on Klasky called uh, Five Dreamers in a Horse by Bahan. Uh, Achatrian and Aren Malakian. Um, I think I think that film, Five Dreamers and a Horse, really, you know, you feel it's being made by by young filmmakers who are in the country now, who are dealing with the reality of what the country is experiencing now. So I, I think you make the films that you feel I I certainly gravitate towards the films. I feel I'm the only person who could make that film. And I think my weakest films are the ones where there might have been someone else who could have made it. Uh, I certainly feel with a film like Ararat, I, I was the only person who could have made that film, for better or worse. That that is my film. You're you're absolutely right, but um, that's a very good question. Um, I'm still involved with with film culture. I'm going back this summer for the Golden Apricot, the film festival there. I was the president of the of that festival for ten years, um, I, so I'm still very much attached to the to to the country, and 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 I. And I, I I love you know watching these classic films. I love watching a film like uh, Menken Mersarer, uh, which is uh, we are we are uh, mountains. Yeah, uh, I mean I just think that's a that's a masterpiece. I think 1969 was was the apex of of, of Armenian film production because that was the year that you had both Pyrojanos masterpiece, Color Pom- Pomegranates come out in '69, and uh, We Are Our Mountains by by Andrik Malyan, which is just is is a sublime, uh, beautiful satire. Uh, written by the great writer Hrant Matavosian. Matavosian uh, also wrote the screenplay for Autumn Sun. So he's an, acute, an observer of Armenian village sort of um, life, but from this very sardonic, and uh, I mean, the the female character in Autumn Sun is unlike anyone I've seen in any other Armenian film. I mean, she's just this very angry, bitter um, uh, woman full of r- remorse. and um, But entirely um, sympathetic as well. Entirely sympathetic. It's yeah. such a beautiful, 
uh, characterization and quite daring. You know, we're sort of moving through her voiceovers and her dialogues. And but I think it's beautifully written by Harant Matavosian. But Harant Matavosian also wrote uh, the script, the story, and the script for We Are Our Mountains. And again, it's this crazy satire of these shepherds. And you know, um, uh, one shepherd accuses his fellow shepherds of having stolen his sheep and barbecued them. And somehow this inspector comes into this, uh, who exemplifies sort of the, the Soviet state, I suppose, trying to to see what the case might be. Uh, it's just it's just the temperament, the humor of it is just it's just a joy to behold. But also for the for the for the fans of Armenian cinema, you have a cameo, or not a cameo, quite a substantial part by uh, Artavets uh, Pelesian, the great. Right. Uh, Documentary filmmaker, so he plays the shepherd uh, whose whose sheep uh, have been stolen and and and, uh, and and eaten by his 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 fellow colleagues, and he has his he bears his grudge, and, and if you know Palacio, a lot of his character kind of uh, filters through this this role he's playing. And that was just a delight to watch. It's so a, it's a it's a real rogues gallery, isn't it? For I mean, it really it's is. A, it's, it's a just... Goodfellas level lineup of. Uh... It really is. It, it, it's, they're, they're the finest uh, Armenian uh, actors, really, of, of that time. And there's this one one sequence in particular. Uh, I think it's the last interrogation, and the way it cuts from that to the the the, the shot of them working in the field, the sound design of all of that. It's just it's it's beautifully, it's incredibly well choreographed. Like the like a uh, Malian who comes from a, a theatrical tradition is just so good at choreographing these actors and these tableaus these long masters and it's just it's it's impeccable really i think it's just it's so it's so well made and i love the way that like you like you describe malen setting up these kind of dynamic tableau and i love the way that he uses the landscape almost as though it's a theatrical backdrop oh uh, so much so yes like these long shots i mean there's a shot where uh, after the last interrogation the two characters are just um uh, outside the courthouse and and it's just it's it's it is a tableau but it's a very subtle use of zoom as well it's, it's interesting because you know zooms are often um derided now but but you know it's interesting when you see them used uh, with with a, with a camera movement and how elegant they can be in terms of uh, uh sustaining you see that also in autumn sun as well like this beautiful use of uh very subtle zoom shots with with movement and and so it's uh, very fluid there's a fluidity and it's 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 actually the same dop is um, it yes yes yeah. uh his name is karen messian and he's just you know he's very skilled at uh working with the with his director two different directors i and i would say malian is is the more assured director um uh yeah, I, it's interesting speaking with you. I mean, I, it's just the links I've had with these films and these filmmakers and um, the, the the way they've inspired me. Uh, I, I think that coming from a theatrical background and still continuing to work in theater, obviously, I, I, I think Malian is, is a really important figure for me in the same way that other directors who've worked in theater uh, extensively and, and uh, like Fassbinder and, and, and Bergman, obviously. Um, uh, you know, Malian uh, in some ways uh, was a very early influence because I, I just saw how you could take the sense of tableau and, and work with your performers in these extended long shots, which were, which had a theatricality to them, but were also very cinematic and very fluid. And as you said, make beautiful use of the, of, of the landscape and, and light. Well, you can't make an Armenian film without really leaning into the landscape. I think that's, yeah, that's a, a maxim. Yeah, no, it's 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 very inspiring when when you're there. And then, as I say, looking at these 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 beautiful monuments, these churches, which are often um, in the middle of these landscapes, right? There, it's quite different from the Western approach, where we identify churches being in a in a community or being in the middle of a city. There are churches which are. You can go to Yerevan and you'll see major churches in the middle of the city. But the most moving thing is seeing these edifices separated and sort of standing alone. In, uh, on top of a mountain somewhere or in the middle of a plain. Well, there's something about that image of the uh, the resolute monument in the landscape, which I think probably serves as a neat metaphor for for Armenian filmmaking, the, make, the filmmaking tradition. And it's been really fascinating uh, to, to talk through these influences and, like you say, this kind of circular resurfering of resurfacing of these figures and these influences throughout your career. So... 
Atom Agoyan, thanks so much for oh, taking thank you. the time. It was, it was, it was, it was really place. lovely to to um, to speak with you. And and I mean, we, it's been wonderful to have this talk. And we haven't really begun to discuss Tigran Mansouri and the, the brilliant composer whose work sort of is 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 evident in, in so many of these films. But you know what what's what's incredible is that I think that um, you know these films are are monuments to the culture and 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 in a, in a time and in a moment when so many of these monuments are being threatened certainly you know like swaths of uh, our ancestral homeland have now been taken from us recently um, you know absorbed back into Azerbaijan and and now these these churches are being destroyed and desecrated and. Um, so this idea that there is a way to preserve them and, and and that we have these these really wonderful works of cinema which which were which will be forever preserved and and these wonderful restorations as well like to see a film like we are our mountains in this pristine uh restoration and it really takes your breath away that the persistence of cinema and uh the ability to, to use these platforms now to 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 share these works and to have these types of conversations it's really a privilege well we're very proud to have that restoration of we are our mountains it's uh, it's it's really stunning like you say so anyone who's listened to this conversation and wants to to dive in get yourself onto classic key and have a have a watch of henrik malian's we are our mountains for your first taste of armenian cinema but uh atomagoyan thanks so much for joining us thank you, thank you.